I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and open it to an old friend, the book of Acts. Turn to the book of Acts. As you're turning there, you know this, I, I, I think you believe this, uh, that all of us, all of you, are on the Great Commission. Now, we don't all do it at the same level or the, with the same abilities, but we are all on the Great Commission. For some of you, that Great Commission is called parenting, right? Um, you are doing evangelism and discipleship with the unbelievers in your home or with your extended family. That's your Great Commission. Or um, you go to school and you are surrounded by classmates um, who are in need of hearing the gospel. Um, others of you at your workplace, you're carrying out the Great Commission in your workplace. Um, we have pastors and elders in our church that we sent away from here, far, far away to, to places like Gilbert to plant a church. And then we sent them even further than that to like Papua New Guinea. And um, so we all are involved in the Great Commission. Each of us brings to those relationships and those arenas of life um, what we already believe about the Great Commission. You already believe some things about what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do and what the Great Commission is all about. You already have convictions formed, whether you've thought about it or not. And there is a book in your Bible that provides the most help possible and the best example of the Great Commission ever being carried out, and it's, it's the book of Acts. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to ask the question, what does Acts encourage me to believe, you to believe, about the Great Commission that you're on? And we should have some good answers to that question. Acts is the gold standard. It records the first 30 years of the gospel being proclaimed from Jerusalem, then all across the Roman Mediterranean world, the first 30 years. The best church planters that church history has ever known were those 11 and 12 men, 13 men, who did that, who gave their lives. The book of Acts is the Holy Spirit's infallible and inerrant testimony to you regarding the Great Commission. And so what does he who wrote this for you, what does he want you to believe about the Great Commission? I don't know if you've thought about that lately. I've been giving some thought to this. As we still push the gospel to the end of the earth, what does the Holy Spirit want us to believe? Now, we have more answers to that question than what we have time for today, but I'm going to give you five truths in just a moment that Acts encourages us to believe. But I just want to tell you up front the kinds of categories that these answers rest in and lie in. These five different truths, they fall into these Holy Spirit determined categories. They are theological in nature. You are required, if you're going to be faithful on the Great Commission, there are some theological truths that you need to know, and not just know, but you need to believe. You need to cast yourself on them. You don't need to lean on them like they're a crutch. That's good, but you're still exercising way too much of your own strength. You need to lie down on these like they're a theological stretcher all your weight off, and you just rest on these theological truths. So some of the things you are required to believe if you're going to be faithful on the Great Commission require you to lie down and rest and entrust yourself to theological truths. That's the Holy Spirit's idea. It's not mine or your pastor's. That's the Spirit's conviction right out of chapter 1. Some of the categories are, of course, what we would call missiological. It's about the mission itself. It's about the practical outworking of it. If you're going to participate faithfully in the Great Commission in your home, at school, in the workplace, you're a pastor going and going to go plant churches or whatever, there are some things that you have to believe and entrust yourself to missiologically, strategically even. And of course, some of these things you have to believe are gospel-y. They're, they're gospel things. 
Um, if, if you're going to be faithful to the ends of the earth, bringing the salvation that God wants to give to sinners so that they can be saved, you need to believe some things about the gospel and you need to hold on to those. And then some of the categories have to do with character and have to do with you and me. So if you're going to participate faithfully in the Great Commission, yielding yourself to what the Spirit is, who He is, what He does, and His power, that's crucial for you, but that's on you to yield yourself to Him. See, that's kind of a character issue. That's not just a theological truth. It's not just something that happens to you. You yield yourself to Him. So, we're going to ask ourselves this morning, what does the uh, book of Acts encourage us to believe about the Great Commission. So before we do that, let's pray, and then we'll ask for his help. Father, that is what we want. We want you to draw near to us, and we want you to help us. We recognize that you have us on the Great Commission where we live. Um, Each of us has varying levels and abilities that are given to us by you. We are not all cookie cutters. Um, Some of us should not look at pastors and say, well, because I'm not doing what they do, I'm really not on the Great Commission. And we shouldn't see differences as reasons for exempting ourselves from participating. Lord, would you draw near to us and reinforce in every believer's mind this morning um, their place in your great commission. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, um, the greatest sending ever from heaven to us, that he might live, that he might die that he might rise again on our behalf. Lord, we're so thankful. And thank you for those brave, courageous souls, parents, children, friends, strangers who were courageous enough to share the gospel with us so that we might hear it, believe it by your Spirit's enlightening ministry in our lives and be yours. And now, Lord, we are on this mission to the ends of the earth. Lord, would you help us this morning? Grow our understanding, deepen our faith in what we must believe, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're in Acts chapter 1. Your first step into Acts is right into this theological subject, okay, by the Spirit's determination. Before any proclamation of the gospel ever took place in the Great Commission in the book of Acts, before the planting of even one church, God wants you to believe this. Number one, the resurrected Christ reigns from heaven over the Great Commission until he returns to earth to reign as king. That is what the Spirit wants everybody in every generation to read in chapter one, starting in verse one. That's not any man's determination. That is God's determination by the Spirit. Do you understand? We are to entrust ourselves and our missionaries and our pastors that we send to this overarching priority first. If we were to start a list of subjects that we should have no doubt about, in other words, that's another way of saying it. What should you have no doubt about as you read the book of Acts? If we were going to make a list, the Spirit in his list started at the top with this one. The resurrected Christ reigns from heaven over his great commission until he returns to earth to reign as king. Let's read verses 1 to 11. Follow along. The first account, O Theophilus, I composed about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over 40 days and speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has set by his own authority. But 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. And a lot of times we stop reading there and we need to keep going. Look at verse 9. And right after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. First, as you read Acts 1 to 11, there should be no doubt about the kingdom coming. The kingdom that was promised long ago in the Old Testament. This is Old Testament driven. Verse 3, for 40 days he is speaking to them about the kingdom of God. This is the resurrected king. He is speaking to them about his kingdom. Verse 6, they know that. Because they have a question they want to ask him. And it comes in two parts. Do you see it? First half, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom? They understand exactly what he is talking about. The restoration of Israel to kingdom status in the the world. The greatest clarity that could ever be given on the kingdom of God was being given to them over a period of 40 days by none other than the resurrected king himself. How clear do you think it was? Flawless delivery. And not for a day. And not for a super seminar that lasted all day. Not for a week. Not for a conference. 40 days. 40 of them. Who could teach the apostles that subject better? Who had better clarity on the kingdom of God? No one. No one could surpass his understanding of it. Who could correct their wrong thinking if they had it? Better. And if they had right thinking in their question, who could leave it alone better because he knew it was right? No one could surpass his understanding of it. Nobody could surpass his father's fixing of the time. Verse 7. I wonder what mattered to the king before he went to heaven. The resurrected king's death and then the resurrected king's ascension into heaven did not redefine what the Old Testament had said about the kingdom of God. It did not nullify it. For 40 days, he's not spiritualizing it. He's not reinventing it because they know what he was talking about. Verse 6 again, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? The question on the apostle, on on their minds, is not if the kingdom of God is still what they had always thought it was. That's not the question in their minds. And do you see that? The question is, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Is it at this time? What does Jesus answer? What does he answer? Verse 7. What does he say? It is not for you to know the what? Time. Does he correct this? No. He leaves it alone because it's right. So it's not for you to know the time. The timing has been set authoritatively by the Father and evidently secretively. We don't know when that kingdom is coming. So their question was not what the kingdom of God was supposed to be now that he had died and been raised from the dead, but their question is simply when? Is it now? You're going to do this. What the kingdom of God is remains unchanged. If there was ever a time to tell us that it was changed, this would be a really good time to tell us before we start going with the gospel to the end of the earth. When the kingdom of God comes remains unknown. What the kingdom of God is remains unchanged. 
And God wanted this very, the very first gospel proclaimers and the church planters, he wanted them to believe the coming of the kingdom of God was still on track before they ever got started. And so with that, the very first church planters, they needed to have a clear contrast given to them uh, based on their question. So verse 8 says, but strong contrast. You can't know the timing, the restoration. I'm not going to touch that. That remains unchanged. Now, in contrast to that kingdom, you shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So what he says in verse 8 is a contrast to what he said before that. Do you understand? Their gospel proclamation and their church planting that is coming up is a contrast to that coming kingdom. And if that was true 2,000 years ago, we are 2,000 years closer (laughs) to that coming of that kingdom. And that is page one of Acts, of your Great Commission book. As you read Acts 1 to 11, you should have no doubt also who's governing this Great Commission before the coming of the kingdom. Look at verse two. Um, He had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Um, This is interesting. Notice the second and the third members of the Godhead are now co-laboring together. The Son and the Spirit are co-laboring together to reconfirm, I know I chose you men. You're the ones I've chosen. And he's giving orders, giving commands to those first gospel proclaimers and church planters. Listen, they are united. These two members of the Godhead are united, unified in authority. And that means the apostles are not a group of men, rudderless, trying to figure out what they should do next. This is not an aimless bunch of men but, uh, who are about to be creative about some really good ideas and just out pop church planting. Wow, it's great. Had no idea that was coming. No, that's not what happened at all. They are following orders. And you should have no doubt about that. And also, as you read Acts 1 to 11, you should have no doubt about the pathway of the king's return to earth with his kingdom because the pathway of return was outlined for them when he left. Look back at verses 9 to 11 and watch all of the emphasis on up, okay? Verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on. And a cloud, clouds are up, right? Cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, as they were gazing intently where? Into the sky. While he was going in that direction, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? The fifth reference of looking up. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. Eight different times, the emphasis is on that's where he's going and that's the way he's coming back. There should be no doubt in your mind about when he comes, when the king comes with his kingdom, where it's coming from. Does that make sense? The emphasis is on heaven. It's interesting that Matthew in his gospel refers to the kingdom of heaven more than he does the kingdom of God. Not not a huge distinction there, but a kingdom that is sourced out of heaven. And that's based off of Daniel chapter 2. And you remember when Smed walked us through that on Sunday nights. That's the great stone that comes to earth and it smashes into all of the other earthly kingdoms. This is the kingdom that will be sourced out of heaven. So listen, when the kingdom comes, you don't look to the east. And watch for it rolling across the land. You don't watch from it coming from the west or from the north or from the south. You don't watch and see if it's coming across the oceans or across the land. You look up. Because it's coming from a realm that has nothing to do with the way these kingdoms here work. Some kingdoms here attack another kingdom and they topple them. And then they fight and then they topple them. That is not the way this kingdom is coming. It's coming out of heaven, and it will smash everything. And the timing of that is authoritatively fixed by the Father, verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has set by his own authority. 
Page one. Page one. It's not negotiable. It's page one. So what does this mean? It means the gospel mission of church planting precedes the coming of that kingdom out of heaven to earth. It does not equal it. It does not replace it. The first church planters, listen, the Spirit would not even let them get started with church planting until they understood this. That the kingdom was still on track and was fixed and therefore not redefined. And it isn't, isn't it interesting that this is the first theological conviction on the king's mind that he wants his church planters to know. We have taken the end things and we have made them so negotiable. Not so the Spirit. This is the first thing he wants clear. And if they were required to believe that before they ever got started planning churches, we're 2,000 years closer to it. Do we understand? Are we any less required to believe our resurrected king is coming to earth to reign? Now listen, um, yes, absolutely, through faith in the gospel, citizenship in that coming kingdom is granted now. You can write down Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He rescued us from the authority of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Yes, now citizenship granted in that kingdom, possession of that kingdom given, position given in that kingdom. That kingdom is not here though because the king is not here. And we get to run with the gospel and plant churches to the ends of the earth before that happens, before the clock runs out. And we are called to believe this, to have no doubt in it. The resurrected Christ reigns from heaven over his great commission until he returns to earth to reign as king. Would you have thought the Holy Spirit would give this theological truth about the kingdom and the Great Commission such priority. Isn't that interesting? It matters to him. Page one of the book of Acts. Let's talk about number two. What does Acts encourage us to believe about the Great Commission? Number two, the Holy Spirit is powerfully present and governs the progress of the Great Commission. So again, page one makes this unmistakable and foundational for the Great Commission. Before it ever gets started, verse four, gathering them together, he said, you need to wait for the promise. The promise is the Spirit, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And with that promise coming, the boundary markers and progress lines are set by the Spirit in verse 8 for the Great Commission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There's power that's needed for this. And you will be my witnesses. And then the outline for the book of Acts is given. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth. Nothing has changed from those first days of the Great Commission to now as we keep pressing the gospel to the ends of the earth. So let me give you a brief survey of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in Acts, and it's for the purpose of being witnesses of Jesus Christ, of his resurrection. It's for the purpose of being gospel proclaimers. First, the disciples had to be filled with his Holy Spirit of power so that they could be courageous proclaimers of Jesus Christ. Look at chapter two, verse four. Here's when the Spirit comes. They were in that upper room. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Drop down to verse 11. All of these um, worshipers were in Jerusalem from all of these different geographical locations, Cretans and even Arabs. We hear them in our tongues, our languages, speaking the mighty deeds of God. The Spirit of God is upon them so that they can proclaim the mighty deeds of God. Now, from that, look at what they were. Chapter 4, verse 1, in Jerusalem, watch this. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly agitated because they were teaching the people and they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's what they are proclaiming. Take a look at verse 7. And when they had placed them in their midst, they began to inquire. Now watch this. Even the enemies of the apostles can see something in them. What's their question in verse 7? By what? What do they say? By what power? What can they tell? 
These guys, these guys have power. Somebody was just healed. What is this power? We can see that. They're not denying that there's power. There's power present. Verse 8, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is not something that happened to him. He yielded himself to the Spirit for fullness. That's what happened. And he spoke up to them. Look at verses 18 to 20. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to hear you rather than God, you be the judge. We can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. We've heard your threats. We're going to press on. The Spirit of God has given them courage. Look at verse 31. They all go back to their uh, fellow disciples, and when they had prayed earnestly, the place where they had gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So they're praying, and they're yielding themselves to the Spirit who has come, and they began to speak the word of God with confidence, it says. Go to chapter 6, verse 10. Stephen is now arguing with Jews who are gathered in Jerusalem, verse 10, and they were unable to oppose the wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. He's yielded himself to the spirit's authority and power in his life, and he is speaking by that spirit. Go to chapter 13, verse 9. So that's Jerusalem. And then an unlikely, uh, but by the time you get to the first missionary journey, that Paul goes on, he's on the island of Cyprus, verse 9, chapter 13, verse 9, Saul, who was also known as Paul, he too was filled with the Holy Spirit and fixed his gaze on him and said things like this. When was the last time you talked to somebody this way? You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? I mean, here's a man with boldness and confidence because he has yielded himself to the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem into the Gentile world, nothing was different in regards to the Spirit. And we too, at the ends of the earth from where they are, we're in need of the Holy Spirit's powerful presence to help us to be courageous in testifying of Jesus Christ to those around us. It's not a question of whether or not we are in Christ or we have the Spirit. We do. This is not mainly something that happens to you unexpectedly. No, expectantly, we yield ourselves to him, the Spirit of God, and power is given to proclaim, to be courageous, to stand firm in the face of threats. So not only did the disciples have to be filled and yield to this power of the Spirit, the early churches saw that and they prioritized leaders who were therefore full of the Spirit. Go back to Acts chapter 6, verse 3. You remember these deacon prototype guys who were supposed to help solve the problem in the church of the Hellenist or Greek-speaking Hebrews. Uh, the widows who are being overlooked, what kind of men did they want? Verse 3, um, select brothers uh, from among you, seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit. That means they are men who have yielded themselves such to the Spirit of God that there's fullness of the Spirit in what they do. That They valued that. They prioritized that. Verse 5, this word pleased the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, who was a man full of faith and of, he was full of the Holy Spirit as well. Go to chapter 9, verse 17. When Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, what did Ananias in Damascus say to him? Ananias departed and entered the house, and he laid his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me, that is Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, were coming so that you may regain sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul is not an exemption, has no exemption in regards to the Spirit. The the gospel expands into Antioch of Syria. Go to chapter 11, verse 24. And they decide, the the church in Jerusalem decides to send Barnabas to them to figure out what's going on. There's a lot of Greeks who have believed. And they say this about Barnabas. He was a good man and he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a considerable crowd was brought to the Lord. So he was a man who was yielded in his life to the Spirit of God, used by him, did not want to walk in his own power. Go to chapter 20, verse 28. Now we're into the Gentile world. We're into Ephesus. 
Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we find out this. Be on guard for yourselves, elders at Ephesus. This is what Paul says to them. And be on guard for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Spirit of God is interested with his power to make um, elders in churches. So the early churches prioritized leaders who were full, yielded to the Spirit of God. And the very advancement and or the restriction of the Great Commission was overseen by the Spirit himself. This is fascinating. Um, You see this back in Acts chapter 8. Go back there with me. I know you're going to be turning a lot. If you're trying to write and turn at the same time, good luck. Chapter 8, verse 26. Philip is into the realms of Samaria when he had, verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, rise up, go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's a desert road. Look at verse 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Drop down to verse 39. He baptizes him. And when they had come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azotus as he, was passed, uh, as he passed through, and he kept proclaiming the gospel to all of the cities he came um, until he came to Caesarea. So again, what is happening? The spirit of God is advancing the gospel by his own doing. Uh, take a look at chapter 9, verse 31. Once Saul has been converted and he heads up to Tarsus, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria was having peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it continued to multiply. The spirit of power uh, was present with encouragement and to help it expand. Chapter 10, verse 19, now the gospel needs to go to a Gentile and Peter has a vision. Look at chapter 10, verse 19. While Peter was reflecting on the vision that happened three times, Who talks to him? The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise up, go down, accompany them without taking issue at all, because who sent those three men? The Spirit of God. Those three men are going to invite Peter to come to Cornelius' house. Chapter 11, verse 12, Peter says about that time, he says, The Spirit told me to go with them without taking issue at all. So he did. This is about the Spirit of God making the boundaries of the uh, the Great Commission expand. Now, look at uh, chapter 13, verse 2. Antioch of Syria is that church that many Greeks believed in is where Barnabas and Saul were at. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 2. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, so they're yielding themselves in humility and in worship to the Spirit of God, to God, and the Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. And when they had fasted and prayed, further yielding themselves, they laid their hands on them, sent them away, and they were being sent out, verse 4, by the Holy Spirit. So the gospel is expanding because of the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting, go to the second missionary journey of Paul, chapter 16, verse 6. This is shocking. Chapter 16, verse 6. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden, what? By the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So who's even restricting the boundaries of when they can go and where they can go? The Spirit of God is. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, in his third missionary journey, Paul will spend more time in Asia, Ephesus, than any other place And then Paul is bound in chapter 19 and chapter 20 in the spirit to go to Jerusalem and face what's going to happen to him there at the end of his third missionary journey. So from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the Gentile world, nothing has changed as we do the same to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit sets the boundaries for the advancements. So what does this call you to believe? That's a little survey of the book of Acts just on the spirit of God. What does this call you to believe? This, that the Great Commission does not operate in the power of your flesh. And it does not subject itself to your human wisdom or mine. It does not subject itself to human strategy. 
It never did in the first days and in the first years of the Great Commission, and nothing has changed to this day. And we need to reclaim this truth in particular and believe it wholeheartedly that each of us is in desperate need of the Spirit's power in our evangelism, in our home, and at school, and at work. And it's not about you waiting for something to happen. It's about you expectantly yielding yourself to the Spirit of God for fullness of His presence so that you can have power and courage to do it. We need to reclaim that. Our missionaries desperately need the Holy Spirit and His power and His wisdom. If any advancement in the gospel of church planting occurs, we know who to give credit to. And equally, if a door closes to the gospel, I don't know, say six canceled helicopter rides, we know who's not caught off guard by it, right? Have no doubt the Holy Spirit is powerfully present and he governs the progress of the Great Commission. Number three, what do we need to believe? Have no doubt about this. The gospel of the Great Commission is the only hope of salvation for sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from good works. This is so clear um, in the book of Acts. Acts will not let you uh, at all avoid this obvious repeated truth that must be believed. Look at chapter 4, verse 12. You know this verse well. Peter says it. There is no salvation, or there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We don't present multiple pathways to heaven. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. Go to chapter 10, verse 43. Peter is preaching the gospel to Cornelius' gathering. Chapter 10, verse 43. And he says, of him, Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who what? Believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You receive forgiveness of sins not by doing good works, not by meriting it, but by belief, by faith alone. Look at chapter 11, verse 20. In the church in Antioch, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch of Syria and began speaking the truth to the Greeks, also proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were proclaiming the gospel. And watch this. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. What's interesting is what brought about that belief was the presence of the powerful hand of God, not men. God was present to help them believe. We need the grace of God, the power of God alone. Go to chapter 13, verse 38. Paul is preaching in Antioch of Pisidia. This is a different region. This is his first missionary journey into the Gentile realms. And he says to the Jews gathered in the synagogue, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. You will find it no place else. If you want forgiveness of sins, Jews, you have to find it in Jesus. And not only that, in him, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. You have been laboring, my fellow Jews, Paul says, to establish your own righteousness and present it before God. And belief in Jesus is what justifies you. You cannot be justified by your, you cannot be declared righteous by your own Alignment with even God's law. Go to chapter 14, verse 27. Paul finishes his first missionary journey. He comes back to the Antioch of Syria and he says this, 1427, when they had arrived, he and Barnabas and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Why did the Gentiles believe? Because God opened the door. Do you want to you have an encouraging um, help in your evangelism, in your discipleship, in your home? Pray this prayer. God, open the door of faith for my kids. I can't unlock it. I can't do it. Will you come and put your powerful hand on me, on my proclamation to them? Put your hand, your powerful hand on them to hear and open the door. Because if you don't open it, it'll never open. That kind of prayer, I'm pretty sure God would be happy to hear and answer. Chapter 15, verse 11. 
the Jerusalem Council. This is what Peter, as somebody, one of the Pharisees, tries to get them to also be obedient to Mosaic law, and he's mixing that in with the gospel. Peter says in verse 11, we believe that we are saved through the what? The grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way that they, the Gentiles, also are. This is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, quite apart from any works being done. The Great Commission's sole message is that the sinner's only hope for salvation is never found in themselves. You never give your kids that inclination that maybe there's there's something inside them that they can turn to. No, you never do that. Zach would never want to do this in the tribe and give them any ideas that they could, um, in, in Papua New Guinea, attain salvation on their own. It is only found in the God man, Jesus Christ, through faith alone. The sinner has nothing to contribute of worth to salvation. That is overwhelmingly true in the book of Acts. Justification, a status of declared righteousness, is never by works of any moral code, including God's moral code, Mosaic law. By God's undeserved favor alone, he gifts faith, he puts his powerful hand on it, he opens the door of faith, and they believe. And all who are appointed to eternal life Believed, Acts 13, 48. You cannot read Acts and conclude that there is any other message than that one to proclaim. You must believe that. Do you believe that? What does Acts encourage us to believe about the Great Commission number four? Gospel proclamation for the purpose of church planting, that is the Great Commission. That is missions. Gospel proclamation for the purpose of church planting. That is the Great Commission. I want you to go back to Matthew now. Go back to Matthew 28 real quick. Let's just refresh our memory with what the Great Commission is there. Matthew 28. Let's take a look at verse 18. And Jesus came up and he spoke to the disciples who were gathered there on that mountain in Galilee. All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Hold that in your thought. Okay, put that in a file because we're going to come back and get it. How much authority? All of it. Where? Heaven and on earth. All of it has been given to him. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what do you do with those disciples when they've been converted? Teach them to keep all that I commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. Now, in Acts chapter 1, we are told that when the Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. So now turn to Acts chapter 14. Because I want to show you how what Luke says about the Great Commission in Acts 14 on Paul's first missionary journey, Acts 14, verse 21, takes the language of Matthew 28 and he adds to it the language of Acts and he puts them together. If you've ever wondered what the Great Commission is, here's the two ideas put together. Chapter 14, verse 21. After they had proclaimed the gospel to that city and what? made many disciples. What does that sound like? Acts 28, right? They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And what did they do with those disciples along the way? Well, they strengthened the souls of those disciples. That's probably parallel to teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. Saying, we're on a path. The kingdom of God is coming. And through many tribulations, we have to enter that kingdom one day. That, he said that right after being stoned. Verse 23, now watch the addition of this language. When they had appointed what? Elders for them in every what? Church. So they're making many disciples, they're teaching them, and what are they doing with them? They're making sure that there are elders and it's called a church. So the Great Commission is proclaiming the gospel for the purpose of planting a church takes the language of Matthew 28 and it extends it into the language of churches and elders. That's exactly what the book of Acts lays out before you. What did it look like to make disciples of the nations from Jerusalem through Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, baptizing them, teaching them in the name of the Father, and uh, uh, teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded them? What did that look like? Well, it looked like them going out, proclaiming the gospel, and then um, gathering them into a body called the church and appointing elders who were qualified. That's what it looked like. 
That's what you get. They preached Jesus Christ crucified for forgiveness of sins. They baptized the ones who believed. They gathered them into local churches. They taught them to obey Jesus Christ and his commandments. And they appointed qualified elders and they called them a church. So just to be clear, as you read through Acts, they did not engage in um, humanitarian causes, as you read. They did not engage in social justice issues that are going on in society. And and boy, were there social justice issues in first century Rome. Oh my goodness. But they kept their eye on the ball. And they preached the gospel. And they called sinners to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. They formed identifiable church assemblies. They appointed elders over them. And they hit repeat. And they hit repeat. And they did it again. And they did it again. And they did it again. It was true in Jerusalem. Um, Acts 15, verse 4, the, the church in Jerusalem is called a church, and they have elders by chapter 15. It was this way with Barnabas and Saul up in Antioch of Syria in chapters 11 and chapter 13. This is true on Paul's first missionary journey. We just saw that in Acts 14. He appointed elders on that missionary journey. It was true on Paul's second missionary journey when he... Um, went out to revisit those churches that he had planted. He went over to Philippi, to the European continent. He planted a church there. He then went on to Thessalonica. He was only there for maybe three weeks on the shortest end. How do you know that was a church? Because when he writes 1 Thessalonians, what does it say in chapter 1, verse 1? To the church in Thessalonica. He planted a church. Berea, Athens. And all of that is the Great Commission. All of that is missions. On Paul's third missionary journey, when he calls the elders of the church in Ephesus, there's elders of a church in Ephesus. This is what he did. Did we beat the dead horse enough? Um, This is what the book of Acts sets before you to believe. Gospel proclamation takes place with the aim of planting churches. Do you believe that? Now, in Acts, let me ask you this question to qualify this just a little bit. In Acts... Can you ever think of a, of a setting in which the gospel was proclaimed, but a church was not planted? How about the Ethiopian eunuch? Acts chapter 8. Yep. God is in control of both of those elements, the evangelism and the church planting. And whether or not they get tied together is up to him. We just be faithful and we aim for both. We we aim for both, but whether or not it happens is not up to me or to you ultimately. It's ultimately up to the Spirit of God. And you need to believe this. There's a lot of things out there calling itself missions. That's not missions, according to what Acts is saying. That's not to say there's not good things to do for people um, who have needs. It's not to say that there's not a need for medical missions in some places at some times in some ways. If you're planning a church in Syria and everything to just happen with an earthquake, you're going to do some really good things that you must do. You must do good to them. But Acts overwhelmingly makes it clear, undeniable, that you proclaim the gospel for the purpose of planting a church. Lastly, number five. The king of the Great Commission neither avoids the snares of corrupt authorities, nor is he thwarted by them. I want, someday maybe we'll, we'll do a whole sermon just on this. This is so interesting. You need to believe this. You need to believe this, no matter where you go, that the king of the Great Commission, he doesn't try to avoid all the snares of corrupt authorities, human authorities. He'll go right through their kitchen and he's never thwarted by them. The strategy of our resurrected king for the Great Commission is not to tiptoe around them or to try to sidestep governing and religious authorities. It's not his strategy to submit his Great Commission to the authorities and ask them for permission if the Great Commission can take place. I want you just to think through the flow of the book of Acts again with me. First, in the more Jewish-centered regions of Jerusalem, Judea, and even Samaria, The Great Commission, the proclaiming of the gospel for the purpose of planting churches, it ran smack dab right into the face of religious corrupt authorities who opposed Jesus. Do you remember that? That's all what happened in Jerusalem. 
The religious leadership of the temple was never sympathetic to the Great Commission. Never. In fact, they tried extensively to stop it at all costs. Let me just give you one example. Go to chapter 5. Let's just watch this. Now things have really gotten to a a, a heightened level here. Chapter 5, verse 17. The high priest rose up and with those with him, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy and they laid hands on the apostles. They put them in public jail. Drop down to verse 28. And they said to them, we strictly commanded you. Okay, we're, we're in authority here in Jerusalem, and, and we're the ones who are in charge, and you didn't listen to us. We strictly commanded you not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. If they only knew what they were saying. Verse 29, Peter and the apostle said, um, we must obey God rather than men. Verse 33, when they heard this, they became furious. They intended to kill him. And then this is, this is incredible. An unsaved guy, Gamaliel, who trained Paul. Look at verse 38. Watch what he says. Men, in, in this present case, I also say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. Look at his insight. If this plan or action is of men, it's going nowhere. It's going to be overthrown. If it's of God, what does he say? Even he knows you will not be able to overthrow them. Or you may even be found fighting against God. How does this guy even understand that? And even the king of the region, Herod, in chapter 12, executed the apostle James, the brother of John. Oh, what was the effect of that, by the way, in chapter 5? Look at verse 41. They beat him. And they were rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they started asking for permission if they could preach the gospel. Nope. Just kept on going. Just kept on going. And as Acts moves you into the the Gentile world, the religious leadership in Jewish synagogues across the, the, the Gentile world, same thing. Paul never tried to sidestep them. Um, On his first missionary journey in in Lystra, Paul gets stoned. They oppose him. Paul's second missionary journey in Philippi, the magistrates, the Gentile magistrates come out and they beat him and Silas with rods, throw him in prison. In Thessalonica, he has to leave in the middle of the night. In Berea, he has to flee again. Go to Corinth. uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 9. You can't go to Corinth. But you can go to Acts 18. I'd like to go to Corinth. That'd be pretty amazing. Acts 18, verse 9 and 10. Watch what Jesus says. This happens to Paul over and over and over. Do you ever think Paul was scared by what the authorities did to him? Or do you just have this view of Paul that he was like, I don't know, maybe the fourth member of the Trinity? Look what it says here. Look what Jesus has to do in Corinth. Um, Acts chapter 18, verse 9. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid. Do you know what that means? It means this. Stop being afraid, Paul. You are afraid. Stop it. Why? Go on speaking and do not be silent. Who are you going to obey, Paul? Are you going to obey me or are you going to obey what's going on, the threats? Why? Because I am with you, even to the end of the age. And no man will lay a hand on you in order to harm you. I have many people in this city. Who does this belong to? This great commission. Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. Paul has a riot break out in opposition to him. He gets taken back to Jerusalem and in the temple he gets beaten. They're trying to kill him. He has to be rescued by Lysias, the commander there. He gets transported to Caesarea. He goes through Governor Felix, Governor Festus, King Agrippa. And finally, Acts ends with him standing in front of Nero or about to stand in front of Nero. Religious leaders, governors, Gentile governors, Gentile magistrates, kings, Caesars, emperors, never sidestepped by Jesus. Never sidestepped. Jesus never was thwarted either by them. In fact, one of the greatest differences between the Great Commission now and the coming of the kingdom of God is that corrupt human authorities right now can beat us up and hurt us and cut off our heads and bury us under a pile of rocks. But when he comes out of heaven and the stone smashes into the kingdoms of the earth, it's over. No more resistance. And they cannot threaten the disciples of Jesus anymore. We are not that right now. But that kingdom is coming. 
and we don't have as much time as the apostles did in Acts. Now, our resurrected king has a plan for us to not sidestep those corrupt to human authorities around us, but instead we respectfully, just like they did, they walked with the gospel right through their kitchen to the ends of the earth. I want you to think clearly about this. The Great Commission did not seek the permission of corrupt religious authorities in the temple, saying, can we, ex- can we exist here in Jerusalem? Can we advance? Can, can we gather and meet together? Is that, they never asked for that. They never asked King Herod. They never, Paul never asked for permission to preach the gospel, to plant churches, to, to, if he could meet with disciples from governors Felix and Festus, nor King Herod. And when he was in prison in Rome for two years, Paul never asked the most powerful corrupt leader of the, of the world at the time if Christians could evangelize, if they could disciple, if they could plant churches, if they could meet together. Why did they never ask any of those authorities for permission? Why did Paul, why did Peter never ask for permission? Do you remember what I asked you to file away in Matthew 28? Why did they never ask for permission? Because they already, what, have permission. From whom? The one who has how much authority? All of it. Where? In heaven and on earth. Our resurrected king never submitted or subjected the proclamation of his gospel and the planting of churches to any other authority. There was no place on earth, and there still is no place on earth where his authority does not stand supreme. That means there's no place on earth where the Great Commission is not allowed to advance, unless the Spirit restrains you. Now, there are places it may be far more costly to advance the church than other places. That's true. But we plead for fullness of the Spirit so we can be courageous in our proclamation and we can plant churches because we are under orders from the resurrected King who has all authority in heaven and on earth to do so. And this is what the book of Acts undeniably sets before you and me. To believe it. To cast yourself down on it. To rest on it like it's a stretcher. I don't need the permission of governing authorities to be the church to gather together, to preach, to evangelize our children, our parents, classmates, co-workers, neighbors. We need to be respectful. We are already under the command to do all this by the one with all the authority. We need to be respectful. We need to be submissive as long as they do not ask us to what? Disobey. And at that point, we do exactly like Peter. Um, whether it's right in the Eurosite to, to ask us of that, it doesn't matter to me. Um, we have to obey God, not you. And if it means imprisonment and we get locked up, guess what we do? We, we start prison ministry and we evangelize and we disciple. And guess what? When we get out of prison, guess what we do? We get back to work and we plant churches. If they beat us, we go home and we gather our, our fellow believers together and we say, what a privilege to suffer for Jesus. Let's, let's yield ourselves to the spirit, have more confidence and more courage and let's keep preaching the gospel. That's what we do. Do you believe that? You need to pray for your missionaries. You need to pray for your pastors who plant churches that they would never take their eye off of this because it gets hard. It gets really hard. So the resurrected Christ, number one, reigns from heaven over his great commission until he returns to earth to reign as king. Do you believe that? Number two, the Holy Spirit is powerfully present and governs the progress of the Great Commission. Do you believe that? Number three, the gospel of the Great Commission is the only hope of salvation for sinners. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works. Do you believe that's your message? Fourth, gospel proclamation is for the purpose of church planting. That is the Great Commission. Do you believe that? And lastly, the king of the Great Commission, he neither avoids the snares of corrupt authorities and he's never thwarted by them. Do you believe that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this amazing book, um, the book of Acts. Thank you for outlining for us um, what we need that will 
sustain us and, and secure us on the Great Commission so that even if um, governing authorities start coming after us, we have a category to, we're not caught off guard by that because it's in the church planting manual of the New Testament. It's in the book of Acts. We are not surprised by that. Thank you for all of these things and many, many more truths that we must believe. Lord, I pray for Grace Bible Church that we will cast ourselves unreservedly on these kinds of truths. And we will allow you by them to uphold us so that we can be faithful on the Great Commission. Lord, we all do it differently. We all have different parts that we play. And that's okay. That's by your design. Lord, I pray that there would be no guilt in anybody's mind because they don't do it like somebody else or they feel restrained and confined at home or whatever. Lord, I pray that you would just help them to yield to your spirit and be courageous and bold and be empowered by you to testify about you wherever you have them. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.